go back to Hannity now four years ago. My next guest, British Member of Parliament Daniel Hannon warned what would happen to this country if, in fact, Obamacare was passed and fully implemented. Now, here's what he said on this very program. So your advice to America is stay away from nationalized health care. I think you're very clear on that. Let me, let me ask you if one you, Listen, if you, if you get nothing else from what I'm saying this evening, please do not make that mistake. If there are any congressmen watching this who think, yeah, it might be a bit fairer, yeah, it'd be a bit sort of cozy, you know, I, I promise you it is worse yeah. for doctors, it's worse for patients, it's worse for taxpayers. But can you explain in, with some specificity why you are giving such a dire warning to the people of the United States? Because you're our friends, and if you see a friend about to make a terrible mistake, you try and warn him. And we've lived through this mistake. We've lived through this mistake for 60 years now. Uh, it began with the best of intentions. It began because people thought it was wrong for those who weren't well off and couldn't afford the best health care to be treated differently. And everyone felt, well, this is it's kind of a nice togetherness, kind of solidarity thing if we all take part in this experiment. But the reality is it hasn't worked. It has made people iller. We spend a lot of money and we get very bad results. You look at uh, survival rates for cancer or heart disease. We are well down on, on all the leagues. We have very few doctors. Uh, we disincentivize people from practicing medicine in this country. A lot of our best and brightest doctors emigrate. Uh, a lot of them go to, to North America. Now, sadly, his prophecy is now our reality. Daniel Hannon is back with us. His brand new book, Inventing Freedom, How the English-Speaking Peoples Made the Modern World. It's now out in stores all across the country. Sir, how are you? Good to see you again. Great to be back. You know, one of the things I've gotten to know you... Um, and you answered it in that question. You love America. You love this country. You love what we stand for. Have we changed? Are we in the middle of changing? Look, I have huge confidence in the American people. And the beauty... Glad you do, because well, I'm, I'm, I'm losing confidence well, day by day. I'm losing confidence in some of your leaders. Me too. But the people are always wider, wiser than the experts. It's true in your country. It's true in my country. And there's a great autocorrect mechanism built into the Constitution where the population can impose itself on the government when the government is getting too big. You know what makes me worry that that is not true? I think after a period of time when you condition people, mentally they are prepared to look to the government for our answers. When you stop teaching them the concepts of individual liberty, constitutional government, they, they think things are in the Constitution that don't exist there. No, that's absolutely right. And that's especially true in a country that defines itself by its ideas, not by its territory or by its ancestry, but by its, its creed. You can become an American wherever your parents came from, provided you sign up to the ideals. So the flip side of that is if you lose the ideals, you lose your identity as a country much more thoroughly than a place which is defined by space or race. You need to teach kids that they are heirs to a sublime inheritance that they have to keep fast and pass on in their okay. turn. I agree with all that, but Europe, Great Britain has a government rationing body with their National Health Service. Um, you look at Greece, which is bankrupt, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, all these countries that are now literally suffocating because of, of the growth of government and the indebtedness. It seems like America is moving in that direction more every day. Do you, it, it, well, on one measure, obviously it is, which is the, yeah. the level of state spending. You know, it was funny. Do you remember right at the beginning of his presidency when Barack Obama was asked if he believed in American exceptionalism? And he said, yeah, I believe in American exceptionalism, just like the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. And at the time I was thinking, yeah, well, that's just Greece. He could have mentioned any country. The more I see the U.S. debt grow, the more I think, hey, it's kind of suspicious that he picked Greece there, isn't it? I mean, this is a Hellenification or whatever the word is of the, uh, of the U.S fiscal outlook. And if enough people become dependent on the state, whether as employees or as welfare beneficiaries, sure, people eventually start behaving and voting like Greeks. When, when I first read the title of your book, Inventing Freedom, How the English-Speaking Peoples Made the Modern World, I, I know, if it hasn't happened yet, it will, that people will criticize it without having even read the book. Sure. Sure. That's you expect that. Standard <laughs> anyway, operating procedure. That, right? Right? It is. I'm sure that the moment it goes on sale, you know, there will be 10 reviews on Amazon saying this is a, you know, Outrageous. racist and all the rest of it, you know, mm -hmm. before they can have possibly read it. Right. The beauty of Anglosphere principles is that they take root anywhere because it is what the Indian uh, writer Madhav Das Nalapat calls the blood of the mind, not the blood of the body. Anglosphere principles are why Hong Kong is not China 
why Singapore is not Indonesia, why Bermuda is not Haiti. If you have the rule of law and personal freedom and individual liberty, it can take root in any society. Is it possible if we, if you say it can take root in any society, I look, I believe that through the prism of history, and I hope I'm wrong, I really, I pray I'm wrong, that we're going to look back as this era, as the rise of the radical Islamist. And America even gave F-16s and tanks and billions of dollars to the leader of Egypt, who was a member and former head of the Muslim Brotherhood. It seems like we don't get it. Well, I think the most important geopolitical question of this century is whether India defines itself primarily as an Anglosphere democracy or as an Asian superpower. And India, by the way, has you know, one of, if not the largest Muslim populations in the world, but without the uh, associated problems of... Uh, uh, Radicalism. Uh, right. And that's because it's a common law democracy. And although it's like your country and mine, it has its imperfections. Of sure. course it does, because you know, perfection is not for this life. But it is a place where governments change peacefully, the army doesn't interfere in politics, and above all, there is a common law system where the individual... And you think reference. this could be adopted and advanced... Even in areas where today, if we were to predict democratization in certain parts of the world, you, you think it can happen anywhere? Yes, but here's the tragedy, right? In the places where it was first developed, mm. in the core Anglosphere territories, your country and mine, we're giving it the up. The system is being betrayed by its own children. Scary, isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, all right. Well, I love the book. Love your writing. Uh, it is a great admonition. You're an American hero. Well, listen, yeah. I, 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 your, your, your current president has a great way with words. We've got to give him that. So let me paraphrase him. If you want to keep your way of life, you can keep your way of life. If you want to keep your constitution, you can keep your constitution, period. No one can take it away from you. Wow. Well said. Daniel Hannon, good to see you again. Thanks for being Thank with us. Thank you.